All right, my name is Rich Schmidt. I'm here today with Rachel Woody. We're at Ponzi Vineyards. It's July 30th, 2021. Before we start, I'd like to say thank you to Maria and everyone at Ponzi for hosting us today. A special place to the archives and so a cool place to do the interview. So, Rachel, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Uh, as you know, we always start these interviews off with the same questions, so we're going to change that up today because we knew you'd be ready for it. So, <laughs> okay. tell us why archives? Okay. Uh, well, first of all, I didn't know what archives was until I was 19, 20 maybe, into my college career at Pacific. Um, I knew I loved history, was a history major like as soon as I went into college, um, but didn't know what I wanted to do with it. The common refrain, which I'm sure some of your students have heard is, oh, what are you gonna do with that? Are you gonna be a teacher? Which, uh, if I knew one thing, I knew that I did not want to be a teacher. So I met with my advisor for my major, and he recommended doing an internship at Oregon Historical Society. So I did an internship there for the summer. They were wonderful in letting me basically do like a roaming internship where I would spend a couple of weeks with each department there and get to really learn what the various jobs could be when working with historical items. and. That is when I first heard the word archives and what is in an archives and, and what that job even is. So mm -hmm. um, for me, that was it, just being able to have a job where I didn't necessarily have to specialize in one very specific subject, one where I didn't have to take a lot of schooling and be a teacher, but could just basically play with the historical artifacts every day and provide access to them, preserve them, yes, but, but basically being able to work with and touch history every day. That's what sealed the deal for me for archives. So let's talk about kind of pre-archives life then. Tell us about you know, <laughs> upbringing, education, and, and then sort of the decision you made after high school. Like what, what was gonna come mm -hmm. after high school? Uh, upbringing and education, um, what got me into history, and I'm looking at my mom over off camera, was because History Channel was always on in our house. Um, a lot of like ancient Egypt documentaries, and so just the, the knowledge early on in my childhood that there were other cultures, and not just other cultures, but the history of those cultures, and it just was this amazing tapestry of different stories and experiences mm -hmm. that I had never known existed before. So that's what got me into history was not necessarily school to begin with, but just what I was exposed to at home. Mm -hmm. um, and so whenever I did have a chance to take a history class, and especially in high school where some classes are no longer required, <laughs> I would usually make sure that my electives um, included some history as well as at the time um, singing was my, my hobby of choice back then. So I would do a lot of choir or um, private vocal lessons also. Um, after high school, looked at various colleges and knew that I needed a smaller setting to feel more comfortable with my education. I knew that liberal arts in general was something I was interested in, in pursuing both history and music. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in looking around, which was admittedly local at the time, because I hadn't ever really left Oregon, um, Pacific University was my choice for a very good music program, but also I really loved the professors in the department, uh, notably Martha Rampton and Lawrence Slippin. So tell us about your experience at Pacific. You mentioned that was when you kind of archives became something you were aware of. Tell us about the other, the other experience at Pacific and, and as you kind of went through school, what you were thinking about your next step. Uh, so going through Pacific, um, I was definitely and remain ambitious, and so in my freshman year, I took a History 400 level class. I believe that one was on medieval women and got an A plus because it was, I enjoyed being thrown off the deep end into subject matter and what that required versus the more general courses. They did not hold my attention as much. Um, so I, as many electives as I could, I took classes that interested me. I ended up uh, with a minor in anthropology as well um, because the subject matter interested me. And the more uh, I got into history, the more I knew, and thinking about careers, mm -hmm. the more I knew I wanted to try and have something that was somewhat relevant to my degree. And so that led to the conversation with my uh, major advisor and he recommended Oregon Historical Society. And so at that point, that was between my junior and senior year, 
And so my senior year, I spent applying to graduate schools and, well, first of all, researching graduate schools that even offered archives management, um, which is still fairly hard to find. It's usually housed within a public history or a library information science uh, master's program. So since I had the history degree, I went ahead and pursued the information science aspect. Mm -hmm. Um, which also offered a concentration in archives management at Simmons, what is now university. It seems to be our running theme in schools. You are, are, are at the changing, <laughs> changing their names to universities. Right. So tell us about that experience at Simmons. You mentioned it's kind of a hard, hard thing to find. Now, now you're, mm -hmm. you're first time away from home and you're in a graduate program. Tell us about that experience and as you went through it, as it, again, as it kind of shaped you, what you hoped to do after you graduated. Okay, so so grad school was hard. <laughs> um, and it wasn't necessarily that the subject matter was hard, but um, being somebody in a particular economic class where I still had to work almost full time to also support myself still through schooling, um, having to do that level of work and then that level of coursework mm -hmm. um, was just like logistically challenging. Uh, also, the fact that it required several courses that were very library science heavy, <laughs> which is, it does not interest me at all. So those classes were particularly hard to um, feel motivated to get through. But the archives classes definitely made up for it. Uh, part of the reason why I chose the Simmons program was at least three of the courses came with required internships, and they actually helped facilitate the matching of those internships, which it's located in Boston. Mm -hmm. There is so much history there, plenty of um, organizations and historical societies that are, are happy to have unpaid graduate level interns. So I was able to get a, a great amount of experience. Um, one was with the League of Women Voters, working with their archives. Um, I also worked at Harvard in the Fogg Art Museum with their archives. And then I was able to do an internship back home for the summer at Pacific, um, which at the time they were starting to get their archives going. So for each of those instances, now that I think about it, each of them, the archives existed, but like it didn't really have any organization yet in terms of like actual staff and people who are paying attention to it. So. Um, now that I think about it like that, that is definitely a running theme where I find myself in places that haven't really started yet. <laughs> but that's what makes it interesting. So you have all these internship experiences and you have the coursework. So what did you think you would do with that as you were, as you were getting ready to graduate? What, did you, what was sort of your goal going forward? <clears throat> At the time, my personality type, knowing that my master's was coming to an end, that whole last semester I started applying for jobs ahead of time, um, which apparently was great foresight on my part because that was right before 2008. <laughs> and I was able to land a job at the Smithsonian, um, which was then the Freer Sackler Museum and is now rebranded as the National Museum of Asian Art. Um, so I was able to interview for a job and uh, accept it before I had even technically graduated, which was amazing. Um, and at that time, I think my, my mentality was mostly just like, please let me get a job, especially getting out of graduate school, which comes with a very hefty price tag and student loans. Um, being able to get a job in the field that I wanted to be in, like that was the threshold. Mm -hmm. So the fact that I was able to apply and then land a job at the Smithsonian with an amazing collection, um, that, was, that was just like the cream on the top. So what was that initial job? What, were you, what, what did you do and what did you think of working at the Smithsonian? So for that one at the um, Asian Art Museum, was, well, the Smithsonian itself is humongous. There's at least, I think, 22 now museums and research centers. And each one of those, for the most part, has their own archives. So there's a lot of archives. And they're of all different sizes and shapes. The one at the Asian Art Museum is of a more modest size because the collection itself, object-wise, was smaller. 
also, at least for the time, um, while the Smithsonian is half funded federally and half funded uh, through like nonprofit donations, uh, mm -hmm. it doesn't get dispersed equally, of course, because they're all of different sizes and there's different interests there in terms of money. So the Asian Art Museum was very modest in a lot of regards, including the budget. And the archives had its first like professional archivist in like the early 2000s and then after that, it, like before that, and then again after that, it was just people who ended up in the archives and did a great job. Like they did get education and um, applied what they need to the collections. But um, when I came in, I was then the second professional archivist and like it had been on a break. <laughs> <laughs> so the collections, some of them were processed beautifully. Others, they didn't even know it was in the box, which is typical for many archives. <laughs> So that's not to disparage them at all, but it meant that while I wasn't necessarily starting the archives from scratch, it definitely needed like a re-emergence or like fresh start kind of thing. Like mm -hmm. a lot of people didn't know it was there. Mm -hmm. Some of them, the staff at the museum, um, other archives, like peer archives from across the Smithsonian Institution didn't really know what was in there, what we were doing. So that allowed me a lot of um, freedom and encouragement really to make something out of it and make it more accessible, um, make sure people knew what was in it. So we played around, we started the Smithsonian Collections blog, which I edited for the first year across all of the archives. <laughs> I also started the October is American Archives Month Archives Fair program that they did um, at now annually in October. So it really allowed me, I think, to blossom there and think of different ideas, try different things. There was a great supportive community there with the other archivists. So even though there wasn't a lot of staff at my location, there were definitely archivists like mm -hmm. across the street, basically. Mm -hmm. So it was a great community, great collection, um, but difficult to be there after a while difficult to be in DC to like even put roots down. It's a very transitory city. Uh, it's expensive. <laughs> um, I was also on the East Coast where none of my or my husband's family was located. So every vacation was traveling to see a family person. Um, and, the, and some of the bureaucracy there, it did get to the point at my location there that after four years, I had pushed the program as far as I could. I kept running into increasing resistance the better I did, which is, especially as a young adult, like flabbergasting in terms of like, I'm doing a good job. We are getting good press. I am bringing in grant money. What's the problem? Which now in my much older, wiser age, I realized probably had a lot more to do with them and their egos versus what I was accomplishing there, so it was time to move on after a while. Before we get to the next step in the process, tell me about some of uh, your favorite accomplishments or favorite memories from your time there. Uh, several. <laughs> um, so there's a carousel on the National Mall, and if you're a Smithsonian employee, all you have to do is flash your badge and you can get a free ride on the carousel. And I can't tell you how many times <laughs> I rode that carousel, um, especially in the summers, it was just, um, a really nice break and a, a bit of whimsy uh, to break up your day. Uh, also, the Smithsonian, there are tunnels underneath the National Mall, and our museum was definitely connected to several of them, so got to explore underneath the mall. Um, there's a cafe down there. It's a very sad-looking cafe, <laughs> but, <laughs> but because nobody else can get to it, it you know, obviously it has an aura of mystery about it. So. Um, that was fun. Um, there's a fossil cafe in the Natural History Museum that's like so 70s, and they may have already redone it by now, but that was like my favorite cafe. Um, so definitely the, the places and the collections and some of the people mm -hmm. I definitely miss. But yeah, it was just those, um, those cool moments of being in that location and being with those collections that I remember most fondly. Mm -hmm. So it's your first real professional experience in the field. Tell me what your biggest takeaways were going forward. What, you, what were you thinking in terms of what did this job teach me that I do want out of, of work and what does it teach me that I, that I don't want out of work? <laughs> uh, Teaching-wise from that job, I definitely came away 
with both the skills and the understanding that if I wanted something done, that it was on me um, to get it done, but also to get the funding <laughs> to get it done. Um, that was definitely the place where I first started learning grant writing, where I first started doing grant writing, um, and quite successfully. So that was a nice, uh, <laughs> nice how that turned out, because <laughs> it was required to do all of those cool projects. Um, I definitely learned and, and still had to grapple with emotionally, even when I came to Linfield, just the, the dissonance of being a person who wants to do a good job and wants to do it for the good of the community and the school, and especially entering into Linfield, which I'm sure we'll get to in a minute, but also what I experienced at the Smithsonian is just because you're doing a good job doesn't mean people are necessarily gonna like you, and in fact may have the opposite effect, which was a hard lesson for me to learn, <laughs> let alone like find peace with that. So from a like adult, professional perspective, mm -hmm. that was that was a lesson learned. Mm -hmm. Well, you mentioned Linfield as your next step. So, so tell me about that. You, you, you're ready to leave DC. Mm -hmm. Tell me what you're looking for next and how you became aware of, of Linfield. So certainly towards my last, um, what ended up being my last year in DC, I was keeping tabs on jobs that would crop up in the Northwest, which admittedly is not a lot. Um, there's not as much sense of history here from a colonialist perspective. Um, so the, the organizations and the funding available out here is smaller, which means there are not as many jobs. Um, so keeping tabs on the job market in Oregon specifically, there's maybe one or two jobs a year that seem somewhat relevant, uh, especially to then what experience and education I had. Um, so first, the, the Pacific University Archivist job had popped up, which I did interview for and got to the top two with what is now Ava, she's the archivist there. Um, which other lesson learned, always be nice to the people who you are competing against because you will definitely work with them again multiple times. Um, so didn't get that one, but then Linfield came up like a month later. Um, at the time it was advertised as part-time. There was definitely like that aura of we're trying something new and we don't know what we're doing, which could be a turnoff for some people, but actually was perhaps of the most interest to me because having done that before at the Smithsonian, sort of relaunching their archives program, the idea of being able to do it from the beginning at the Linfield Archives was incredibly exciting. Mm -hmm. There was no like, what is this? Or at least very limited kind of issues you'd have to deal with. Um, grant writing was most definitely going to be required for the position, so that was definitely something I found out I was very good at. Mm -hmm. um, as well, of course, as being able to work not only with a community of students um, and mentoring, which I discovered at the Smithsonian I really enjoyed, um, but also being able to work with the wine community. And while wine in and of itself is lovely, and I do enjoy it, the industry out here in Oregon, as you are all aware, is uniquely different from wine industries or you know luxury beverage industries anywhere. So the fact that we would be able to capture that, especially at such a crucial stage where you know older generations, we were already losing some, mm -hmm. needed to document the history, it was not just for the Willamette Valley, but for the entire state. So just the, the enormity of the mandate and the freedom and opportunity for all of that was all very attractive, which was enough for me to be like, I can totally do this part-time because I know within a year, I will be able to prove that like, this should actually be full-time, mm -hmm. which at the time was probably naive, but within 10 months, I got moved to full-time. So that part did end up working out. Maybe not naive that it should be full-time, but maybe naive that it would be full-time. Sure, <laughs> yes, that is probably more accurate. So tell me about what you remember of the, of the process of, of interviewing for the job, and what, 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 was your, what were your perceptions of the level of understanding of what you would be doing or what the need would be of, of, as you were going through that process? It was definitely, it was both a sense of hit the ground running, but still at part-time, to try and catch up with what dynamics were already at play in terms of setting up the archives, um, what the various stakeholders wanted, um, which fortunately the library director at the time, who did help bring the archives into being, 
um, was very candid <laughs> about the different people who would have a say, um, including President Helley, of course, this was part of his vision. Um, faculty member Jeff Peterson, of course, had been doing the Oregon Wine History Project, which for unknown but still connected reasons may or may not be part of the archives at that point. Um, so there was definitely, it wasn't just me reporting to the library director or me reporting to President Halley about the project. Um, it was then also trying to keep in mind that there's an entire staff and faculty at Linfield that I needed to at least get some tepid amount of buy-in from, if not full enthusiastic <laughs> endorsement. Um, as well as students, I wanted to get students into the archives. Um, that is one thing I love about Linfield is the emphasis on experiential learning. And so wanting to bring the student community in and then like the whole entire wine industry, <laughs> which is, is the whole state and different regions. And it's already had at that point 50 to 60 years of its current history and dynamics and the various people who informally would have a say. So it was, it, it was a lot <laughs> in terms of figuring out sometimes um, through experience who had influence, who thought they had influence, um, what the various stakeholders wanted because it was all different, um, and then trying to address all of that, which I think in the end, we ended up doing a good job. But it did take a couple of years, and I definitely didn't get a whole lot of friends on the staff and faculty side. But I got all of the other parts that matter. As you came in, what did you think the biggest first steps were for you and for the archive? Well, it had a physical space. So that was nice that that was done. <laughs> shelving, climate control, even a few supplies. Um, but it didn't have, at least for the wine archive part, it didn't actually have any collections yet. So going and getting the collections, which I then found out actually needed to be like an educational tour first. <laughs> because while this idea had been talked about with the wine industry, it was not talked about with anybody who knew anything about archives. And so the, the understanding of what was needed, when, why, how, like all of that, I realized belatedly just had like never been communicated to them. Mm -hmm. So it, it did end up being a tour of which one was coming and speaking with Maria. She was one of the first mm -hmm. here at Ponzi that um, Susan and I came out to have those initial conversations with. Um, and really figuring out First of all, what, what their understanding was, and then doing a bit of slow and gentle education around what archives actually is, and how they could participate, and it's not required. Um, and then I think by that, like close to the end of year one, is when I figured out finally that oral history interviews was probably the easiest and most effective way to document the history immediately and also be something that would be an asset to those people who do those interviews because of course not only does that help them document their legacy at a certain point in time but it's also something that they can use for raising brand awareness um, something that can help when they do transitions whether it's generational transition or being bought by a different winery transition so the the interview serving as like a multi-purpose multi-benefit asset for everyone involved um, quickly became like the go-to, hey, let's at least interview you mm -hmm. and get you on the record. Mm -hmm. If you have items, great. If you want to give them to us, we've got space. If you don't, that's fine too, mm -hmm. because now what we're learning, and as with archivists who work with many communities that are still alive and present, that is their stuff. So you can't just come in and take their stuff, especially when it's like a family history. And for a lot of the wineries, it's like a small business feeling. So a lot of the materials they have are incredibly personal, even though they also happen to document the wine industry. So the idea of being able to do digital surrogacy, so taking a digital image and then publishing online and they get to keep their stuff, um, seemed like a much better strategy to have and I am somewhat pleased to see is being adopted by a lot of archives now across the country. Mm -hmm. So was your understanding then that 
that as the archive program was getting started, that the Oregon Wine History Archive part of it was the, the key, the most important part, the, the, your first priority? Depending on who you ask, um, there would be different answers <laughs> in terms of priority. Um, overall, and certainly the public priority, was the wine archives. Um, that was what President Helley wanted. They, that's how they got buy-in from the wine industry, though that didn't come with any money at the time. Um, however, in order to try and foster goodwill and in general be a good archivist, the fact that the archives was housed in the college at the time, now university, it's still there <laughs> physically, you need to still also collect that organization's history. And so I don't think that was technically communicated as part of my job at first. That was certainly the undertone I got, especially from some of my direct report people. So I tried to do both. Um, the wine history part, of course, is the, the more glamorous perception one, and so that usually generated the more interest, so we would certainly make sure we spent a lot of time working on that, but for the remaining time, we also tried to do the same thing for Linfield's history, especially for our college, where I think by the time we were both hired, had already celebrated its sesquicentennial, its 150 years, so the fact that they didn't have any sort of archives concept or even like a feeling like maybe we should have this, as an archivist, like I just could not. Um, so very, very quickly, unfortunately, I was allowed, I had the freedom to spend time on both because I think we were doing a good job at both. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So with that kind of challenge, let's talk about, the, before we get to, back to the wine archive, let's talk about the Linfield part of things. You mentioned 150 plus years old at this point already, and certainly things have been preserved through history, but not in any kind of sort of regimented uh, mm -hmm. way. What was the biggest challenge for you then as you were as you were on campus now, and, you, and there is a program, what was the biggest challenge for you in, the, in terms of getting that started? Was it, was it letting people know that you were there? Was it finding materials? What, what was the biggest step to get a Linfield side of the archives off the ground? Hmm. <clears throat> I think for the first part, and, and this is true for many archives, is figuring out where people put the stuff. Because there will always be people in an organization that are like, we should probably save this for better or worse. And so I think over the course of the five years I was there, there were at least five or six times a year where we would get a phone call or an email, usually last minute, and usually precipitated by a, we have to clean this out by today, <laughs> sort of situation. Um, there are 20 boxes. And so for some of that, it was amazing. We didn't know it was there. Um, great stuff. And for other stuff, it was like, we seriously do not need any more copies of the 1980 yearbook. <laughs> so uh, that was part of it. Um, I think also just um, similar to the wine industry, trying to get the word out on like what an archives even is. And I think especially since the public perception was that it was a wine archives first, foremost, and maybe only for a little bit. Um, people just didn't necessarily think of the archives as something they could tap as a resource, mm -hmm. both in terms of placing historical items there, but also in terms of use. Um, that generally did increase um, quite a bit after a couple of years, but even just being able to get the word out there, like, not only are we interested in your stuff, but we have stuff. Mm -hmm. so. If you need like a picture for the newspaper or if somebody recently mm -hmm. passed away, like we have assets that could be helpful for you to do your job. <laughs> so after a couple of years, I think we did get there, mm -hmm. but it was an education on that side as well. You talked a little bit about the unique challenges of the, uh, of unique challenges of the Wine History Archive. Um, tell me about what you thought as it was the first couple of years as you're, as you're kind of shaping it. How, we, how was it going to work and how were you going to involve students in it? What was, what was mm -hmm. the plan in terms of how it would be kind of, a, a, you mentioned a um, experiential learning experience for, mm -hmm. for students. How was that going to work? How were you going to bring students in, involved? So starting out, especially part-time, I knew there was no way 
I could get as much done just by myself. I think I was also very um, pleased that there was a paid option to have students work in the archives. Previously at the Smithsonian, even though it's humongous and there's probably money somewhere, they just don't pay interns, or at least they didn't when I was there, um, which bothered me from an ethical perspective, and still does. And for Linfield to have the option of work study, student employment over the summer, um, was such a great um, motivator to not only like, yes, I need help, but I can also pay students to do this learning and to help. So um, that was wonderful. I think Susan also, who was the library director at the time, um, was very encouraging of the archives taking on students. Of course, the library, as you know, I think is the number one employer for Linfield students. So at least it was in keeping with the department. Um, I think there was a little grumpiness from some of the staff members on how many students I got to have for a while there. Um, but there was always stuff to do and the students there are just incredible in terms of their drive to learn new things and especially because the archives can be such a foreign concept if you've never grown up knowing what it is, um, their ability to just dive in and have that natural curiosity of the objects, of the stories of the people that we're working with, um, all of that made for really great student employees, but I think it also helped make great experiences for them mm -hmm. in a professional sense, of course, but also for some of them helped them determine what sort of career paths they wanted, whether that was directly into wine industry or into archives, or if that was taking what they knew, um, like with oral history interviews and pursuing anthropology graduate school. Um, it was my hope, and I, I think we achieved this, where they would get at least a few things out of their time mm -hmm. with us as employees that they could take with them for whatever their career path was and is. Mm -hmm. so you talked about being dropped into kind of a, an industry that was big and growing and expanding. And tell me about learning it. What did, what did you need to know about the Oregon wine industry? Uh, and how long did it take to feel comfortable kind of knowing who the players were and knowing what the key parts to work on would be? So I started out with an academic approach, which was reading any of the Oregon wine books that were out there at the time, um, of which there's now like twice as much. <laughs> um, learning the stories that way, um, and especially as more and more collections came in, like reading the newspaper clippings from the time, um, getting to know the industry from those press publications, which of course is like the glossy story of it, and then getting to know the industry through the documents we started to acquire. Um, one of our first collections was from the Wine Board, which was perhaps the most helpful collection for me in terms of learning the inside version of how they got to where they were. Because of course it was a tremendous amount of work that they did which is part of the, the amazing story and why they are where they are now. Um, but also how much strife and challenge it was to try and corral, at that time, a modest amount of people, but all of um, you know, conflicting needs from different like, regions of Oregon, so different grapes, so like the question of identity couldn't even easily be answered. And if you don't have an easy identity, then how do you market, which for the wine board was one of like their first mandates, mm -hmm. is marketing for the entire state. Mm -hmm. um, so that collection was very helpful in terms of like, oh, okay, so these various regions, this has been a historic issue for them. It is still very sensitive. Um, these are still issues we're seeing today or reoccurring. Mm -hmm. So that was helpful, especially the more interviews that we did which provided further personal commentary and insight into those issues and opportunities. In doing more of the oral history interviews, especially after those first couple of years, hearing those personal accounts of their history and of the challenges and opportunities that they were facing, it of course helped fill, fill in even more of that context in terms of where people were coming from, um, as you can imagine, for some of those issues, people had very strong opinions on how 
it should be run, and it was at such a critical point in time for them to like help protect agricultural land, to help make sure that their um, wines were of a certain purity level, so that they would be, you know, be valuable and taste good, and not ruin the rest of the perception of the industry. Like these were all critical um, elements to have at a point in time where they were establishing themselves as an industry and what they would be known for even now. Mm -hmm. So I, like, I get that the, the pressure that they each must have felt when also considering that for practically all of them that started in the beginning, this was their business, their family business. They may have had a second job, but they certainly hadn't had a second career. Um, so it was make or break for them and their families too. So some of the decisions being made at the industry level would have significant impact at the individual and family mm -hmm. levels. So. Um, having that context of just how critical it was and why it was not easy and why some of those things are still being discussed and debated today, that was perhaps after seeing the documents and reading the stories, like hearing each person's story. Mm -hmm. If I had to do it all over again and I already had all those pieces available to me, I would have started with oral history interviews and probably only <laughs> the oral history interviews um, coming in. So. So the, when you decided that oral history interviews as a, as a kind of the most valuable part of, of gathering the story as it's being done, mm -hmm. tell me about getting that started. Obviously, there's, there's a lot that goes into an oral history interview that goes on before and after this, the actual conversation. So tell me about planning out how the process was going to work and, and figuring out who to talk to. Um, I laugh because you asking that, um, we, it's been so long and we've done so many that I forget how hard and how much thought went into it to begin with. Um, oral history interviews in general, especially if you didn't go into your career as an oral historian, can be quite intimidating um, for many reasons. First of all, like having to be recorded even though you're not on camera, high pressure situation, um, the people that we interview, um, you know, pillars of the industry, some of them are quite a big deal. <laughs> um, and even if they're not popular in a, in a traditional or public sense, you're still the one who's in charge of recording their story. And ultimately, it is on you as the interviewer to get that story. Um, and for each person, because it is an incredibly uncomfortable usually for most people to be on the other side of this camera. It, it's your job to make that less of an issue as well. So you're controlling an intellectual element of the questions, tracking the story as it's unfolding, bouncing around to different questions, especially if they're not opening up immediately, as well as technical, which thank God for the students, like being able to <laughs> not have to worry about the technical side of it while you're doing the interview, as well as the physical side of it of we are sitting down for several hours, it's not always comfortable, are the mics in the right place, she just touched her hair again like with the microphone situation, so like tracking that as well and wondering if that is an issue too, like all of those things, it's a lot. Um, which is why it's so exhausting <laughs> <laughs> after an interview. Um, but it's also so enjoyable. Like the more you do it, the more easy it is. And ultimately, I think if you can remember and enjoy to be in the moment with them telling their story, like that is amazing. That part is the enjoyable part. Mm -hmm. um, in addition to collecting the history of it, of course. Um, which got me off track. So deciding how to set up the oral history <laughs> interviews, that's all to say there was a lot to think about. Um, we did reach out to several different peer archives. I think Willamette University was one of them uh, with Mary Nick Robinson and figuring out what, like, what equipment they were using. At the time, many archives tend to just use audio only recordings, which from a technical perspective as well as a budget perspective, I kind of get, but there's so much more context being conveyed if you can get a visual with the audio. So we prioritized doing video with audio, um, which meant that we had to figure out what camera we needed. Um, <laughs> and then of course, audio, which going with the uh, lavalier microphones was definitely a good call. 
um, from the beginning. So, so learning like a whole other technical craft that like I had never had to deal with before. Mm -hmm. um, but fortunately, I think we got right early on. In addition to the legality issues, so actually working with the not official lawyer of Linfield, uh, John McKeegan on the oral history forms, because the archives, you can find various oral history forms online, but doesn't meet Linfield criteria because it's a legal form. Um, in addition to just like, how do you even go about asking people to come do an oral history interview with you? Mm -hmm. And for the first few years, much like the archives, like a lot of people don't know what that is, let alone like what historical value that might have, let alone what sort of like benefit it might have to them being the one interviewed. So conveying all of that in addition to making sure all the logistics were also taken care of and heaven help us if we were traveling too, which we did for the first several dozen mm -hmm. um, to Southern Oregon and then out through the gorge. So it was, a, it was a lot to figure out and it took at least a year. Um, and I think it was a grant from the Oregon Wine Board that helped us acquire the equipment, do that first trip. Um, they then funded a second trip. So many thanks to Oregon Wine Board for helping us figure out the oral history program, which now I, I think you would agree is like the hallmark of the wine archives. It's mm -hmm what you're known for and has proven to be quite an asset to the wine industry and mm -hmm. Oregon tourism mm -hmm. in addition to you know history. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I will second the thank you to the Oregon Wine Board for their support especially in those early years. Uh, you, you talked about the trips so tell me about the, that. The, that. That was the first real foray into oral history back in 2013. Um, what was the what was the genesis of the idea? Why, why go to Southern Oregon? And how did you make all of that work for those first couple of trips? Yes, so um, thinking about bringing in grant money just in general because while Linfield had funded the position, that was about all that was funded. Um, so <laughs> just needing to bring in grants in general was a priority. And after that first year, realizing the oral histories was probably a great first like threshold to accomplish in establishing an archives. Um, then on top of that, also coming to the realization, um, back to our previous question and answer session on just the, the issues of the different regions and the, some of the disagreements because of the difference of needs. Um, it had come up many a times at that point that Southern Oregon, there was this sense of being an afterthought or you know the stepchild etc um, of the larger wine industry um, the perception then and probably still now is that Willamette Valley Pinot Noir is like the Oregon wine industry which of course it is not um, <laughs> by any stretch but um, for, the, for that and other reasons uh, Southern Oregon needed attention it was also a strategic move on my part because it is the Oregon Wine History Archive. So it's supposed to be for the whole state and I didn't want us starting out. I didn't want us starting out with the perception that we were only ever going to pay attention to those in the Willamette Valley and that we would only ever pay attention to like the cool kids or the famous ones. Um, really trying to stress early on that we are documenting the entire state and I think at that point um, we started realizing and um, placing emphasis on it's not just the winemakers or the winery owners either. That would only be a partial story. So focusing on all regions and then also focusing on all aspects of the industry started to emerge at this time as my own personal priority. Mm -hmm. If we were going to set up the Oregon Wine History Archive, that is what I felt needed to be prioritized, especially at that point in time mm -hmm. where we're still proving ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, also, what had been raised to me as a strategic issue, which I felt less important about, was um, Southern Oregon University also has staff and faculty there who are also documenting the wine industry down there. And so there is perceived conflict there, <laughs> um, but also opportunity. and especially when we're capturing oral history interviews and we're taking digital surrogates of documents, like we can share those. Mm -hmm. um, 
So that was the plan, and we even partnered with Southern Oregon University, um, which was a smart move because I think it finally stopped some of those people from worrying about the competition aspect, maybe. But we went down there, we got the interviews, we worked with Southern Oregon, created some partnerships with both the wine industry down there and Southern Oregon University. So to me, job done, that was successful. Mm -hmm. um, and we continued on then doing the rest of the region. So the next year we went out to um, down the gorge and to Walla Walla, mm -hmm. which again is a, a perceived area of conflict because the Walla Walla wine region is a bi-state region. Washington and Oregon, and different laws there, of course. Um, and so depending on where your vineyard was and also where your winery was, determine how people identified in that region. Also, it's, it's mostly known perception-wise as a Washington region. So why were we there kind of thing, too. Fortunately, we had an amazing partner at Whitman College. Uh, Melissa was there that we worked with, and she even did half the interviews with us, which from like a labor perspective was <laughs> very helpful. Um, and it was an amazing trip. We, and we shared the interviews. Like again, it was, um, it was a smart partnership, not just strategically, but also like to make sure that we're documenting the history accurately. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm not sure if that answered your question, but. Totally. Okay. <laughs> So in addition to that, obviously you have a huge story to tell in the Willamette Valley and you've, you've, you've gotten some buy-in from some of the pioneers already. What's the, what was the biggest hurdle after that? After that kind of initial like, we have the students, we have the materials, we have an archive, we've gotten started. What's the next big hurdle that you had to clear as, as the archive was growing? Hmm. I think at that point, for me, and especially once you were able to join the archives and the students got going and the students were able to finally train new students, like we had so many processes in motion at that point and the reputation had developed to a point um, where we didn't need to put as much energy into those things. And so for me, it's, it's always the what's next. Like now that we've solved that problem or scenario, what's next and because things hadn't been resolved at least between me and a lot of the staff and faculty on campus the opportunities that may be available to somebody who's not me in growing that archives was probably much different um, that's when it started getting difficult in terms of thinking of new ideas thinking of doing new platforms um, doing different projects, working with students differently, teaching curriculum kept getting brought up and then not because whole question and, and issue around faculty versus not faculty, let alone compensation. Um, things started getting frustrating for me at that point. So as much as I did love the collections and the job, the students, my coworker, um, it got to a point where I couldn't do new things and continue to be successful in new things and so um, it, it, as we found out didn't work for me before that happened um, how, how did you know how did you feel the archives was was working did you feel like you had been successful in the things you wanted to do hmm. For me personally, I measured success in a couple different ways. I mean, there was always the annual report that Susan had us do. So there, you know, there's the, the quantifiable with the numbers, how many interviews, how many people watched the interviews, how many students did we hire, how much money did we get? Like, those are good benchmarks. And we always, it, from my opinion, kicked ass in those areas. Like, not a problem. Mm -hmm. For me though, from, for personal success and satisfaction in what we were doing was, are the students happy and thriving? Are they safe and supported in this environment? Are they learning new things? Are they excited and figuring out how that applies to what their life looks like post Linfield? So student, um, how, how they are doing was one of those. Mm -hmm. Um, how are we doing in the industry? What is our perception 
Um, what are we providing them? What's the reputation that comes from our work? And so after several years, I felt like we were in a really good place. We were going to the Oregon Wine Symposium. People were expecting us to be in industry places, events, and meetings because they perceived us at that point as part of the industry, which depending on who you ask in different perspectives, may or may not be true. But being a partner in this project, I think that perception is incredibly important. I think that's why people continue to give us their time, space, and resources to help document this industry. Um, so the, the perception and appreciation from the industry we were charged with documenting, for me, that was a marker of success. And that's something that you don't put in, in an annual report. Like, how do you quantify that? So I think those were the two important areas to me, since we already, like, we were bringing in money, students were working, collections were coming in, like those were checked off easily, mm -hmm. but are the students happy and thriving? And does the community, the wine community specifically, mm -hmm. view us as their equal partners? Mm -hmm. And I think that they did and do. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that I, that I came on board here at some point along the way, and, and I remember our conversations about um, the challenge of starting with, at the sort of starting at the beginning and at the top with the biggest names in the industry <clears throat> and trying to take it forward. So I'm curious about strategies that were developed at that point to make everyone aware that the archives was for everyone uh, in mm -hmm. every conceivable way. Mm -hmm. How did how did it grow at that point? How did you, how did we get past that initial like after the initial hurdle of of Pioneer Archive, Yamhill County, basically Willamette Valley families that have been here for 50 years. How did, how, did the, how did we get to the next step? Well, the hardest part is to get started. <laughs> and so there were the easy ones we were supposed to interview, as informed by other people who weren't in the archives, um, which was super fun. Uh, and, so, and so we started with some of the obvious ones, some of the ones who had been involved in getting the archives set up to begin with, Susan Sokolblosser, Dick Erath, the Ponzi's, of course, David Adelsheim, like Myron Redford and Vicki Weddle, like many of whom were just so generous of spirit and time and continue to be just lovely people. Um, so I ended up, <laughs> one of my default modes is brutal honesty, <laughs> which for the most part works out for me. Um, and so my approach with them, um, especially because they were so kind and lovely, was we are having a challenge here getting people to like return my calls, return my emails, like participate in this process because they don't know what's going on. They don't know who the heck we are. Like, especially in those first few years, it was really difficult. So getting them to recommend like, okay, who else should we interview? Mm -hmm. Can we use your name? <laughs> <laughs> um, and even having at some point, um, Betty O'Brien, that woman is a saint, like she, for a couple of them was like, you need to go talk to the Oregon Wine History Archives. So those peer referrals mm -hmm. definitely helped us get over that hump. And then of course, the more people that you interview, the, the more awareness there is to the project, first of all, um, the more they started going online and people putting them on their Instagram and Facebook, the more it's like, well, why am I not being interviewed? So then it became like a FOMO thing. like. <laughs> You know, am I, and, and then we ran into, am I important enough to be interviewed? Mm -hmm. So then we started running into like imposter or, you know, what have you sort of hesitancy mm -hmm. in which I know you and I both had to spend a lot of time in person, phone and email being like, no, really, <laughs> we do want to interview you. And the more interviews we got from non winery owners and winemakers, I think the easier that got for us as well in terms of like, we just interviewed a Cooper at a Cooperage, like, or a wine label maker or what have you, like, your story is important mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. So that, so then that part got easier. Um, so I think between sort of like the grassroots efforts, the, <laughs> the asking for help, um, the, the more you do, the more people see it, I think all of those things eventually snowballed mm -hmm. into where now it is not as hard to <laughs> nail people down for an interview. Um, people are volunteering, which is great. Less work for you to do logistically. Like, um, 
it, so it, I think over a couple of years it, it quickly picked up pace. Mm -hmm. um, but the first year or two was certainly difficult. I think we did maybe a couple dozen interviews a year those first two years, and then it was like 100. And like you did, was it almost 200 the other year? Or over 100. Yeah, yeah. So, and a crazy amount when you actually like figure out how many work days there are in a year. <laughs> so yes, <laughs> it was a, a multi-pronged approach. On that note, was there a was there a tipping point for you in terms of uh, awareness in this archives in general or the organized archives specifically at, at Linfield? So tipping point for you at which you felt that awareness had sort of been reached, like we were like we the the hard work of, of letting people know that we existed and why we existed and what we wanted to do had gotten easier and, and mm -hmm. more more people were aware than not? I think after the third year going into the fourth, um, certainly when we went to the wine symposium and had like, what, the five minutes or whatever they could fit us into the <laughs> lunchtime schedule, um, being able just to make that statement to like the entire industry in the room, I think was a good point in time where I felt at that point most of them already did know, mm -hmm. and if they didn't, now they do. Mm -hmm. um, and at that point we had also just finished up the 2014 tour of the Gorge through Walla Walla, so we could technically say we had been to almost all of the regions at that point because Snake River Valley um, at the time we hadn't gotten yet. Um, but we could at least say like, yes, this archive is representative of the entire state. We have more than just winemakers or winery owners now. Um, the Phil DeVito collection, I think, was one of those great first collections that came in that was not of a traditional like winemaker wine owner sense and it was such a great collection to bring out because of phil's connection to like almost everybody in the industry they knew who he was and it was such an entirely different collection of historical information mm -hmm. because his was on the the restaurant side in the portland restaurant scene and being one of the first um restaurant owners in the industry that would like prioritize and bring in great Oregon wine for their menus. So for so many reasons, I think that was also like a, a point in time where it's like, yes, okay, this collection is rounding out. Like we're doing a good job. <laughs> we talked earlier about the interview process and it feels very meta to talk about the interview process during, <laughs> during an interview between two people who do interviews. But you mentioned that it wasn't really your background. It wasn't really necessarily your interest coming mm -hmm. into archive work. Um, tell me about that process for you of, of learning how to do it and, and learning um, what the important parts were and, and of learning to enjoy it. Uh, how, how long did it take to feel like you were good at it and how long did it take to feel like you were enjoying it and that it was worthwhile? Okay. Uh, so they didn't teach it in my graduate school. Um, of course, working in archives like it's usually one of those like, oh, there, someone at some point did some oral histories that are on cassette tape. We don't know what's on them. Like, it, so like they're in the archives, but they were never really a focus, at least educationally, <laughs> of like being a part of mm -hmm. the record. Mm -hmm. um, so it wasn't until the Smithsonian and at my museum, there were a couple people who had worked there for like 20, 30 years who were retiring like all at the same time. And so it was this critical like, oh my God, you need to do an oral history interview. You're the archivist. Um, unfortunately, having a vast network of peers across the different museums, there was a trained oral historian at the main Smithsonian archives. And so I cannot remember her name, but she was wonderful in taking time, letting me use her equipment, going through the process of how to put together an oral history interview, first of all, because as you know, there's research, how to develop a set of questions, let alone like the technical and like actually doing the interview. Um, so I learned from her and did my first few at the Smithsonian that was mostly like retirement retrospective based, mm -hmm. um, fairly low stakes in terms of like, they already worked there, they loved the museum, like no surprises. <laughs> Um, and on, on a very focused, like their tenure at the museum doing their job. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas with the wine industry, and then especially once we started getting into alumni interviews, it's like you don't know necessarily what their opinions are of things or what they want to talk about. So you'll find that out when you're talking to them. 
<laughs> you have to be okay with impromptu and like improv situations. Uh, also, like uh, at least exhibit extrovert tendencies, even though obviously it's intense listening. You have to be at a point where you are completely at ease so that they can feel completely at ease doing this not comfortable uh, interview setup. So, um, Launch, realizing that I needed to launch the oral history program at Linfield for the Wine Archive um, did come with some like, do I really have to do this? Because <laughs> it's not incredibly comfortable yet and it is going to take a lot of work. Um, the work part was not as daunting. Obviously, we figured that out. Um, the interview part took a while. My very first interview, I think, was with Bill Nelson in the Oregon Wine Board offices. Bill Nelson in general, maybe he's not this way really, but I just felt this way, very intimidating. Like just his persona, like not overly verbose, um, very professional, like there's nothing about him that made him seem mean. Um, but just realizing like this is like a pillar of the industry, this is my first interview doing this kind of interview, I don't even know if the camera's working because <laughs> I'm doing it by myself. Um, so for many reasons, um, mostly not related to Bill, it was intimidating. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I was super glad when that interview was over. I think it was maybe a half hour or so. Um, but my next interview was with Philippe Giraudet. Um, it was down in Southern Oregon, which again, thanks Oregon Wine Board. Um, he was the first interview down there in Umqua. And Philippe is this lovely gentleman, um, Swiss, but right on the French border, beautiful accent, beautiful philosophy of life. Like, I'm pretty sure that interview is two plus hours, like we basically had to go until the battery was dead. Um, but he poured a glass of wine, we did the interview outside, which then apparently be became quite typical, but <laughs> at the time it was like, okay, this is where he wants to be interviewed, this is where he's most comfortable. Um, so his interview, for other reasons, I think I, I had a student with me, mm. Mitra, who was able to do the technical part of it, so that one was much easier. Mm. And at that point, I think I pretty much fell in love with helping them tell their stories, especially with people like Philippe, who just have an amazing way that they look at the wine industry, why they got into it, why it matters, not just to them, but to Oregon. Um, you know, and no one's story has been the same. So as far as like that curiosity piece for me, like we are always learning new stuff. Mm -hmm. So. I, I got over <laughs> any sort of hesitation or um, worry about intimidation pretty quickly after that. You talked about impromptu and improv. Uh, <laughs> I have no idea what you're talking about, obviously. Yeah. Um, tell me about some of your memories of that. What, what were some of the things that, you, that caught you off guard or you were unexpected? And, and, and how did you deal with it? How do, how do you deal with it when you're on a live camera with someone who's telling you their story? Oh. A couple stories came to mind. <laughs> um, dogs. <laughs> so many dogs. <laughs> and and with, like obviously we are animal lover, lovers here. Um, but trying to like gently pet the dog and not have the tripod fall over, <laughs> and also like hopefully not have them bark. <laughs> um, so happy problems there. Um, there was <laughs> definitely a point in time where there was a technical issue. Um, for one of the trips, I had asked the student at the time to download after every night because we, do, we were doing two interviews a day, filled, filled up the memory card, etc. Um, and she thought she had that night, but then it turns out it didn't actually, but we had already deleted on the camera. Yeah, so there was definitely some people freaking out. I, I don't think I was one of them. <laughs> But we did have to inter or interrupt Melissa, who was doing an interview with that same disc card, to be like, I'm sorry, not to freak you out right now, but let's pause. We need to see your camera for a second. <laughs> and we had to, um, fortunately, Toby was on that trip, my husband, um, and who can fix anything. And so he was able to retrieve the interviews from that day. Thank God. You know, it wouldn't have been a huge deal if not, like, you just interview him again. But um, that was one of the like, okay, <laughs> not only do we need to try and fix this, but we also have to inter or interrupt an interview in progress to go get that thing before she tapes over it. So, um, so a technical issue. Um, emotions, obviously when people are telling their stories, it's very personal. Um, 
and you experience the emotions with them anywhere from like joy, bittersweet happiness, extreme tragedy, anger even. Like I think we've experienced all of those throughout the various interviews and for us doing the interview it's not about policing the emotions like that's part of their story but we do need to fill it and be in it with them um, in order for them to feel comfortable telling that part of the story and so for some of that there's tears and I, I am an easy crier so like <laughs> if anybody starts crying I am crying too um, and knowing when to allow space for that on the camera per se and knowing when that person needs to take a break mm -hmm. and either way being completely okay with whatever that person needs mm -hmm. so it's a bit of trying to anticipate that for some people they want to try and like fight through and like and stay focused and for other people it's like we we need to take five minutes to just have a cry both of us <laughs> Uh, which is why I think for so many, you know, once we do those interviews with them, like we are bonded for life, you know, and it, it's why I think when things later happen to them, like some of them passing away impacts us so deeply. Uh, you know, I think people tell us things in these interviews that they may have never told anybody else in their lives. So that is such a, an honor to have and is so deeply impactful. Mm -hmm. I like it into a series of very intense first dates where you just like learn everything about a person <laughs> in like an hour and a half yeah. and then you're bonded for life, like you that, said. That is such a great way to look at it. It's, not, it's like, the opposite <laughs> of speed, like the opposite of speed dating. Right. Very <laughs> intensive. Tell me your whole life story. No judgment. It's a safe space. Also, we're recording it because <laughs> it's weird. <laughs> So you mentioned that it was it was time to move on from Linfield. Before we get on to the next step of, of your of your career, let's talk about looking back, either as you left or looking back from now. What did you feel like your biggest successes were at Linfield? And the students, for sure. The students themselves as individuals, but I think also the program that we built there for the students who continue to work there. I think the experience in the archives, especially taking them out into the field and meeting these people, whether or not they end up in the wine industry, I think does a lot for them developing not just professional skills, but confidence in themselves at such a crucial point in young adulthood. Um, you know, it's been a pleasure to see so many of them grow up, um, even in just the couple of years that we get to work with them. Mm -hmm that definitely, I still feel very proud about our work there. Mm -hmm. um, I think the other thing is knowing that we did a good job setting it up, like the, for so many people having so many opinions at the beginning, none of them fortunately didn't know to have more specific opinions on how that got set up. Um, which meant that we could do it thoughtfully. Mm -hmm. And I think particularly when we think of the wine industry um, objective to the, to the archives, knowing how to do it respectfully, developing those partnerships, raising that awareness, um, and especially with the focus on the oral history interviews, um, being trusted with their stories, their documents, all of that is a big deal um, and is uncommon in archives because for most archives usually the collections that are in your care either were already there or somebody passed away and now they're ending up there so there's not usually like a live person that you interact with um, whereas that's all we did uh, for the most part um, working with people who are very much alive and, and still creating history mm -hmm. uh, for the most part. So I think that put more pressure on us to develop and cultivate respect mm -hmm. and trust. And I think we did a really good job. So I think I'm very proud about that too. It brings me one more question I'm going to ask. I know I said I was going to move on, but I have one more question to ask. And you talked about the kind of the, the, the charting your own path. So when the archive started, 
a fairly unique concept of having a, a wine history archive to represent a state. Uh, yeah. uh, tell me about the, there was a goal in mind when the archive started that, that Tom Helley had had, that, that Susan Sokolwasser had had, Jeff Peterson had had, there was a goal in mind. When you felt like you reached that goal, how did we chart that path uh, next? What, what, how did we decide what the priorities were uh, and how did you decide what the program would look like without really a, a template to draw from? That's apparently where I do my best work. <laughs> um, the, the goals in mind initially from those outside perspectives uh, was collect the stuff, bring the stuff in, like where are the boxes? Like there was an unusual amount of focus for people who don't really know what archives are to bring in stuff for the archives. <laughs> and especially when working with people, like for, for some of those initial founders, some of them had retired Others very much have still not retired. <laughs> so they're, they're still maybe using their stuff or, or not ready to let their stuff go. Or maybe the kids might still need their stuff because the kids just took over. Like there, there were a lot of logistical things we had to navigate with this industry who's still very much alive. Um, so <laughs> we brought in as much stuff as we could for the people who are ready. And then for the rest, it was just a, when you're ready, we're here kind of mm -hmm. approach, which is all we can do. <laughs> um, and after a while, and I think especially once we really started getting moving with oral history interviews and we were bringing in grants for students to do amazing work, I think that took the pressure off of where's the stuff because we're at least still doing stuff. And, and using the students in a, a great experiential learning environment. And so we're still hitting like the Linfield mission, mm -hmm. um, still working with the wine industry. So it was still like checking those boxes for those people who were um, keeping score <laughs> on that. Um, and it, it got to a point where I did have to have a couple conversations with a few of them about the fact that the mandate that was handed is a statewide mandate and what that means and also if you are saying that you're documenting wine history, the industry for the entire state, that means more than just the owners and the winemakers. There's so much more, especially the older and more sophisticated this industry gets. Mm -hmm. um, so it took, I think, a little convincing for some that that was a worthwhile objective to have. Mm -hmm. Um, I think there was some concern about us spending time and resources on not as important people from whatever judging metric was being used, but I think we were able to do it anyway <laughs> and prove the point. Um, there was definitely a lot of like, this is right and it's in alignment with what we're supposed to be doing and at the end of the day, I will get the job done and then deal with whatever political consequences, um, which again, spoiler alert, is probably the reason why I left. Um, so yes, so after a while, while still dealing with some um, difficulties, some hurdles there, it, I became more and more convinced, and especially the more that we did, the more stories that we got, that this was the right approach. It was certainly resonating with the industry. We were getting further with them. We were developing better relationships. It was bringing the money in. So like, why would you not do grant projects that appeal to people who will give you money for them? So just like for me, it was like all of these things just lined up in terms of like, this is a no brainer. So let me do my job. This is why you hired me. I think I heard you say that a couple of times while we were working together. Uh, so you uh, decided to leave Linfield uh, 2017. Um, tell me about at the time, what, was the, what, 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 what were you going to do next? And, 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 and how did it end up? <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Um, so for a variety of reasons, things were difficult for me at Linfield, some of which we talked about. Um, also some personal stuff, trying to get a handle on my health. Um, getting old sucks. Um, and it, it just got to a point with me at the job that as much as I love some aspects of it, the other aspects were, were too big to ignore at that point. 
Um, I did try to apply for some related archivist jobs at other institutions, but again, not a lot of those jobs out here, especially for like mid-career archivists, which is what I was entering into with 10 plus years experience. Um, and part of some of the personal angst I was experiencing was the, in addition to the lack of respect from some people, was the, the lack of worth. I knew my worth, and while a lot could be forgiven with low compensation for love of the job, love of the people, um, in the end, not having some of that respect and some of that freedom, uh, it became too much mm -hmm. in addition to not being compensated the way I should be. Mm -hmm. There were many a conversations where I did try and make positive change there for a while, try and fix the problems so that I could continue to do the job that I loved. Um, several things were asked of me during that process that were highly unethical. Um, and so through that, I decided I needed a break. I took a health leave, which ironically at the time, um, the person in charge of the human resources department was probably like the worst person during that entire experience, um, which is sad for Linfield and sad for her. Definitely sad for me, but it's the reason why I quit, which I think turned out to be a good thing, so I guess thank you. Um, <laughs> and, and I didn't have a, a job after that, which um, I think says a lot about why I left mm -hmm. to the people who are still there. Uh, for a couple months, took a break. Applied for like adjacent jobs and nonprofits. Um, always got really far in interviews, but in the end it was like, but you've been an archivist for 10 years, so like, what do we do with that? That's <laughs> sort of the, the sentiment. Um, and because the field is so small, a lot of people know each other's business, um, and people had been paying attention to what I was posting on LinkedIn, which is a platform that I have always engaged with heavily. Um, and so they started sending work my way. So like, um, Willamette Falls Heritage Foundation was my very first client. They had called City of Portland to say, we need, it, we need a consulting archivist, like, can you help us out? And so at that time, the people that I know there was like, well, Rachel's available. <laughs> and it just sort of went from there. I mean, at first it was like, well, no reason to say no. Like, I'm not doing anything right now. Like, I'd love to go play with the collection. Um, and after that project, I loved it so much that I ended up setting up a website just to like, we'll see where this goes. <laughs> And fortunately, Toby, uh, my partner, has an IT job. Had an IT job. Um, <laughs> fun story for that later. Um, but fortunately, made enough money, and we had made financial decisions where we would be okay with just one salary for a while. So I had had the luxury of a spousal subsidy to figure my stuff out. Um, and within six months to a year, I got up to a full client load. Turns out, I'm really good at this. <laughs> and enjoy it like the so getting back to like the figuring stuff out and the learning like the whole business side of it like never took a business class really like it i'm doing really well like mental health perspective wise being in charge of actually everything who i work with how people treat me how i let people treat me um my value so like so many of like my hot points that ended up being um deal breakers for my previous two jobs, like I was in charge of that now. Um, and getting paid my worth and being respected and doing amazing projects with people who actually want to do that work mm. makes such a difference. <laughs> uh, so that's what happened. Mm -hmm. What are some of, the, some of your favorite projects you've worked on as, a, as an independent consultant? Mm. They're like all my favorite children. <laughs> um, <laughs> I have had a, a long-term relationship with Astoria Public Library. Um, they were one of my first clients in that first year or two, and throughout the various grants that we've been able to land, we've been able to continue that work with a collection that is one of the oldest on the West Coast. Um, and, and for them, it, it was very much a typical archives in the basement situation of, we don't really know what's down here, let's do something with it. Um, so being able to work with the library director there, the city historian there, who are both amazing people, 
um, bringing in grants. We, we were able to bring in an IMLS grant for this most recent round. Um, getting stuff online, getting it so that people can actually use it. Um, all of that exciting stuff is probably up there in the top 10 mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. terms of great work and being able to work with them long term. One of the biggest challenges for you now as an, as, uh, as an independent, you talked about all the benefits. Uh, what are the biggest challenges for you and what are the biggest challenges for you in terms of letting people know what you, what you can mm. do and, and how you can do it? Yep. Uh, Challenge-wise, at least getting started and then especially with COVID having happened, from that mental perspective, trusting myself to be able to do a good enough job to survive business-wise um, has been a, a great lesson learned, um, but obviously was challenging. Like, fear is natural. Uh, running your own business is hard. Not many succeed in the first few years, especially in a field that's so specialized. Um, so knowing the stats and doing it anyway and trusting myself to figure it out. Mm -hmm. um, Definitely a hardship explaining and educating what I do, um, which for any archives, that's difficult when you're trying to explain what archives is and why it's important and then what your job is with those things. Um, and especially starting out as a business, I think for many new business people, the impulse is to offer anything. Mm -hmm. What do you need? I'll do it. Like, need the money, need the clients. However, the more I've gotten into it um, and the more specialized I have committed to, like digital collections management, who knew? Um, pretty big market out there for <laughs> that kind of work, especially after COVID. Um, so that's the majority of my projects now. But um, narrowing that down and again, trusting yourself and becoming more specialized has ended up helping that because the people who end up finding me already know what a digital collections management system is because they know they need me. So there's already some um, filtering out, I guess, of the people who end up finding me already know they need me. Mm -hmm. Like they, they already know what is happening, know what they need and know that they need someone to help them do it. Mm -hmm. So that has helped. But it has definitely been an education over these last few years especially when you're like creating your website, trying to create like a directory listing, like how do I distill what it is that I do enough where like if nobody knows what I do, that they would be convinced that they should hire me. Like that's a big ask. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I don't know if I've nailed it yet, but it has gotten easier. You mentioned COVID in 2020, obviously a huge, a huge something, something huge to deal with for all of us, especially someone owning your own business who traveling around and working with collections. So, so tell me about 2020 and, and sort of immediate, immediate <laughs> impact on you and what sort of pivots did you make last year and what, and what did you notice, what did you notice was needed that was different than, than had previously been needed? What, what changed last year for what people were asking of you? Yeah, so obviously COVID for the United States started being a real thing in March. Um, that's usually when my conference season starts picking up, like the very first one is usually spring break. And so it was this spectacular domino of conferences and clients that I was supposed to travel to, like between March and July. I think I had at least five trips already scheduled, like already like tickets booked and everything. And just the, not just like cancellations, but then also like continual postponements. So like one of my Delta Airlines tickets, I changed eight times. Like we had to spend an hour and a half with customer service at one point just to like get the credits figured out. Um, so that was hectic to say the least on that part. Um, plans changing and changing again. Um, one of the clients I finally just saw last month that I was supposed to see in April, 2020. Um, so yeah, spectacular like implosion of any plants mm -hmm. I had, and I'm sure that was the case for many people. Um, that meant a lot of question marks around like what aid, if any, would come to small business owners. 
do you then apply for unemployment aid versus um, the PPP loans? Can you do both? Like the, the question marks and confusion around all of that for a small business person to try and figure out, um, let alone try and get the aid, because of course for any of those that you apply for, it took months for all of that to actually sort out. So like, again, thank goodness Toby had a job because we at least had one constant income coming in. Mm -hmm. Um, so the, the first few months of that were awful for so many reasons. Um, many of the projects I had going, even if they weren't like logistically impacted by COVID, the, the people there were, you know, people were trying to figure out remote situations, childcare. Um, so work just wasn't, even if it was already there, it wasn't as available for me to actually like get some hours in and move projects forward. So having to be okay with that um, on a compassionate level, but also like a can my business still survive level. Mm -hmm. um, eventually over the summer, aid started getting figured out. Um, some of the clients that I had existing projects with, we did eventually restart. Um, I also just started, because I couldn't do anything else at the time, my focus immediately shifted to, so what can I do for other people? And so that's when I started doing a ton of webinars. Um, which turns out I like. Um, but at the time, it's like, okay, here's this new thing that we're figuring out, the technology, the legal aspect, the content. Um, but they have been, I think, from, from the feedback I have gotten from people, they have really been very helpful. Um, and I even focused, so for me, knowing the challenges that they would be facing would be justifying their positions, mm -hmm. protecting their positions and their collections, trying to bring in money, all of the things that we already usually struggle with as an archives, but even more so when budgets are being slashed. So putting out content that would help them communicate value of their work, mm -hmm. value of the collections. Um, I did an entire webinar on how for them to even calculate their value. Turns out I have a lot of experience in that. <laughs> and so, uh, I think I've done, my last count was 39 webinars this last year and, and have spoken with so many people and have received some great notes of gratitude from them which make it worth it to me in terms of spending the time and, and putting out the content for free, of course, mm -hmm. um, to do that for them. And while that focus was on helping them by doing them this last year, it has also had the benefit of raising my profile in the field. And so I think that now, as things get to a new normal, um, I've had several clients come in that know me from those webinars. And so by the time we have a conversation, it's a when can you start versus like any sort of what can you do for us and how much does it cost? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, which has been a nice transition. It makes my job easier. Um, so that, that has been a nice benefit of a way for me to get my knowledge out there mm -hmm. and help colleagues, but also help my business mm -hmm. um, in that sense. Mm -hmm. So what's next for you then? Disneyland. <laughs> um, I am exhausted, admittedly, this year, last year, so it's been a lot. Um, as people started coming back from the holidays with the vaccine on the horizon, I think a lot of people started feeling more optimistic, so a lot of projects got kicked off. Um, so I now have the happy champagne problem of having too much work. <laughs> um, so for the moment, I am working way too much, but um, I am hiring my first full-time employee, a Linfield alumna, and she'll be working full time for me starting August 2nd. So thank goodness, um, not just for me and my rest, but it's <laughs> going to be so nice working. I mean, she's not a student anymore, but like that mentorship aspect, um, she's a history major. So being able to come back into the field, she'll be coming with me to do the civil rights oral history projects. Like, actually being able to do that work, work with history, I am really proud and happy to offer that opportunity to her. And I'm really looking forward to having like a, a partner mm -hmm. in that work mm -hmm. and not being solo anymore. Mm -hmm. 
I think to this day still the only history major to work in the Linfield Archives. So I think you're right. <laughs> a lot of English majors. Uh, English majors. Yeah. It's, and I'm now an English major in charge. It's probably all my fault. So you know, going back to the Oregon wine industry for a second here to kind of wrap this up. Uh, you obviously got to know the industry in a very interesting way. You know, you have an interest in wine and familiarity with it, but get dropped into an industry that is growing and expanding and has all of this, the facets that you described earlier. Tell me about as your awareness of Oregon wine raised. What were what were some of the kind of hallmark values of the industry, and, and what's changed about the industry since your awareness of it? What, what, what's different about it now than when you started working with it? One of the things that I still think about. <clears throat> is one of the common refrains, and I always get it wrong, but it's the rising tide lifts all boats. Nailed it. Perfect, thank you. <laughs> um, I still think about that, and I may have heard it before doing these interviews, but it was new to me at the time, that the phrase, first of all, um, let alone that concept applied in a business capacity. And so I think especially after this last year, doing those webinars for free, um, developing partnerships with competitors um, as a means for survival, if nothing else, it's also been really fun. Um, I have thought about that a lot and I have thought about the wine industry a lot this year, not just thinking of them because of the COVID hardship, but of that, of that as a business strategy. Like, it is a value, obviously, and it's, it is one of the hallmark values that the Oregon wine industry is known for. But it's also an excellent business strategy. Like, you guys are neighbors. Uh, you're going to need to like borrow a cup of sugar or tractors or what have you in, in several of the stories we've heard. Um, when, when the fires happened, like how they band together, it's just incredible. And it helps the entire industry stay healthy. And so the, I thought about that each time I partnered with somebody, each time I did a, a webinar for free, um, because it, it, it does help everyone. And even though for some of them they are my direct competitors, they're also incredibly smart and interesting people. And so in partnering on projects with them, it's actually led to like several paid partnerships as well where we have been able to get creative enough to figure out how to make it work for both of us. Um, so I, I think and I credit the wine industry each time I say yes to those opportunities or create those opportunities. Mm -hmm. And again with the industry and of course not, you're not as tightly connected to it as, as you were but what do you see for its future here? As obviously you've been a part, you've been a, you've been a part of, what, of documenting a lot of its growth and change. So, what does it look like as you go as going ahead? What do you what do you hope maybe for it, and maybe what do you what do you fear as you look ahead? We have heard many an answer on this one, and especially these last few years, between the various you know environmental devastation pandemic devastation. It has obviously been rough for them. Uh, we've heard a lot of um, fear around the ever increasing amount of wineries and vineyards. Um, we've seen the, the buyout or um, investment from outside wineries into some of the founding family wineries, which also sends some like shock and fear to others. And I'm not sure that those worry me. I think, I think the ones who are smart and thoughtful about it, I think that they will survive just by that very nature. I think we'll unfortunately lose some good people. Um, but I think what worries me the most in terms of what may happen to them is all external. So continued environmental devastation, um, whatever this pandemic is doing, because it's still not over. <laughs> um, but the industry as a whole, I think has proven itself wily enough, uh, nimble enough, even now, uh, to continue to survive in some form. Mm -hmm. 
All right. That's all the questions that I have for you. As you know, open forum at the end. Is there anything I didn't ask that I should have? Anything we didn't cover that we should have covered here today? I think you were incredibly thorough. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully not overly so. Well. No. Um, do you have questions? You had mentioned earlier um, how unique the Oregon wine industry is compared to other luxury beverage mm. industries. So what do you think is the most unique aspect of the industry here in Oregon? Mm, just one. <laughs> um, the first thing that came to mind was that commitment to the, the purity levels. Um, you know, being able to, if it's a Pinot Noir bottle, like it has to be like, I think 97% Pinot Noir grapes. If it's, you're saying it's from this region, it has to be this certain percentage of grapes actually from that region. I think that has done a lot um, to keep the quality high, but to also, that goes into part of how they market it. Um, that quality level is part of that brand awareness. So I, I think that attention to quality and like that, that fierce um, commitment to it is, is part of I think why people love them. Um, I think the, especially seeing them now, a lot of the, the wineries and the tasting rooms, the focus on experience. Like yes, the wine is good, but it's also about the experience of it. It's so much more than just the, the bottle of Pinot that you might be drinking. It's drinking it with an amazing view. It's uh, drinking it by being able to chat with the winemaker that day on, on what she was doing or, or what her thinking was behind the wine. Like there's the, the experience and the context that the Oregon wine industry prioritizes and provides to its consumers, whether locally or international, I think helps set the tone for what that means, whether it's like you're drinking, you know, Erath Pinot at your counter or if you're enjoying Ponzi's amazing winery out here in Tasting Room. Um, I think that's why people come here too, which like as people who live here, it's like, oh, well, we could just go wine tasting in time, no big deal. But people fly here for that, um, which at least as I'm an Oregonian born and raised, so like having it not really be known for its wine when I was growing up, it's, it's a whole new wonderful and sort of weird thing, I think, what they've created here and, and people will travel here to have that experience. Mm -hmm. So, does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what do you want to see change for the Oregon um, Wine History Archive in general? Like, what do you want to see for its future? Ooh. Wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> um, hmm. Well, first of all, I think the only, okay, <laughs> I'll back up even more. Um, emotionally, it was very difficult to leave. Even though I needed to leave Linfield, it was hard, obviously. Especially when you create an archive, it's really hard to leave your baby. Um, and I think the only reason that that was even remotely easy for me was that Rich would be able to be in charge of it. Um, so that was important to me. I'm glad that is what happened especially having worked together so closely for four of the five years to get it set up. Um, knowing the quality of work, the vision, I knew it was in good hands, uh, as it has proved to be, now being almost 10 years old. So I, I think similar to the wine industry, my, my fears are external um, for what may impact it. Resources are always tight in the best of times. Linfield is going through a hard time right now resource-wise and ethics-wise. Um, and, and with the archives, like it, it's one of the few places on campus from an outside perspective that is actually healthy and still like doing its job somewhat. And so it's like, how do you keep that going when the rest of the university is very sick? Um, so that's my concern. And I, I know that there's not actually a lot other than continuing to try and do a good job and not let it impact you. Um, so yeah, my, my fears are external. My, my vision in an ideal world is that it would be funded appropriately, that you could hire as many students as you wanted, that you would have more space, <laughs> more equipment, um, and of course being compensated for your worth as 
the students as well. So those would be my wishes for you, but I know there's only so much um, that is up to us at a certain point. So yeah, otherwise keep doing a great job. <laughs> Thank you. Anything else? Oh, come Ooh. on back. I'll be quick. <laughs> So kind of shooting off of that, um, in terms of the archive for the um, Oregon wine industry, as an archivist, what do you think is the greatest value that the archive provides back to the industry? Record of legacy. Um, while certainly at the individual level, but I think more importantly and more impactful at the, as the state history, as the industry, having even just knowing that those records are there and available for research, no matter what kind of research. Knowing that we have those stories, especially as people pass or move on, um, just having that, the continuity of that record, recording that legacy, having access to those stories. I mean, how many people tell you that they listen to the stories as they're getting into the industry? I mean, there's just so many ways you could apply what we've gathered to marketing, business strategy, um, thoughtfulness about where you might put your vineyard, different winemaking techniques, like such a thorough archive of knowledge that you could apply in so many different ways. So yeah, sky's the limit. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for interviewing with us. Thanks for obviously for setting up this program and, and being the reason we're all here doing this today. Um, thank you again to Maria and the team here at Ponzi mm -hmm. for letting us use this beautiful space and come out here and enjoy this. And let you off the hook All with right. minutes to spare. Thank you.